Welcome to this meetup, the, I guess the first after summer vacation or during yeah. summer vacation. I guess some of you are maybe here on vacation duty. My name is Christian, I am from Swisscom. I'm a co-organizer of this uh, meetup together with André, most famous. And I must admit he does most of the work or all the work of the Unity Labs. But I help sponsor the drinks, so drinks are yeah. partially on me. <laughs> So I guess we have a very interesting topic today is kind of, you know, something else besides the finance stuff we've been seeing so far, uh, something in, in healthcare. I've been waiting to see something like this. Let me welcome you to the, uh, introduce you to the speakers. Uh, Dr. Albeyati, he's an actual doctor, <laughs> so like a physician, <laughs> hospital doctor, and Mo Tayeb, yeah. They will explain us their concept and ideas and product called Medical Chain. Please, Excellent. the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Christian, and thank you, Andre, for setting this up as well. Thank you for having us. They just flew in today from London, so um, I really thank you for that. I mean, not many people do that. So no, it's a pleasure. Awesome. It's a pleasure. Um, we're excited today to talk to you about a platform called Medical Chain, and uh, this is a platform to host electronic medical records as well as to utilize electronic medical records using the blockchain technology. Um, so I'm Abdullah al uh, I graduated in medicine in 2011, so I've been a doctor nearly for seven years. My training is primarily in surgery as well as in emergency medicine, and I'm now working as a family doctor, uh, and I'm also part of the board of the General Practitioners, which is our version of a family doctor in Leeds, which is one of the biggest cities in the north. And this is Mo. So yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Mohamed Tayeb. Um, in, in my uh, recent career, I've been investing in technology companies uh, through either venture capital or private equity and um, helping turn around. This is a project that I'm really passionate about, so I've uh, gone on board full time and uh, looking to see it through. Uh, we'll talk, uh, I'll talk more in the second segment about technology, so I have a little stuff first to tell you about the background, how we got here and what we've done so far. I said so. We're hoping in the next 30 to 40 minutes we can cover these key areas for you. So we want to explain to you how we got to where we are today by the beginning of the journey. What was the idea? What was the problem we were trying to solve? We actually did solve a, a, a big problem uh, which we're utilising the National Health Service of the United Kingdom, which we will elaborate on more, and how we've now moved on to this bigger idea of medical chain and using the blockchain technology. So how did this all begin? Essentially confusion. Confusion is the biggest driving force for a doctor. What I mean by this is when I see a patient who comes to see me, I have some questions. And the questions I have are, what medical problems do you have? What medications do you take? Are you allergic to anything? I'm looking at your chest x-ray here. Is it the same as it was before? Now, if you and me are interacting in the same clinic or in the same hospital, I might have all those records of yours. Or if you've come from another area, you're a traveller, or you have gone to even another hospital in the city, I won't have access to those records. And I'll have many, many questions that you won't be able to answer. And with that lack of information, I won't know what investigations to do. I won't know your specific diagnosis. And more importantly, I won't know the advice or the treatment that I'm meant to give you. Maybe everybody in this room is quite young, so you're quite clued up. But if you imagine your relatives or your, your elderly family, they wouldn't really remember all of these details. If we run through a normal scenario of our patient here, Joe Smith. So Joe will go see Dr. Nick, okay, very reliable and trustworthy doctor. I'm sure you know him from The Simpsons. Dr. Nick will form a plan and say, Joe, this is what's wrong with you. Take this prescription and go to the pharmacist. Joe will take this prescription and go to the pharmacist. Now, Nick and the pharmacist won't really talk to each other. And when Joe brings this prescription, the pharmacist will issue the drug that Dr. Nick said. But the pharmacist might have a better drug. The pharmacist might have a better idea if he knew or she knew what the condition they were treating. So they're really depending on Joe to know all of the information that Dr. Nick has told them. And likewise, when Dr. Joe goes to see his helpful, friendly family doctor, Dr. Hibbert, Dr. Hibbert is waiting for a letter from Dr. Nick. But in the meantime, Joe will say, look, he told me I need to start this medication straight away. I can't wait for the letter. Please, can you do this for me? So the strength and the weakness of our current health system worldwide really is we heavily depend on the patient. So you might have the perfect patient, okay? Somebody who's very intelligent, retained all the information that I was telling them, understood all the jargon that I was telling them, and wherever they're going along their travels, they're managing to always carry their medical records wherever they are. So that's great for me as a doctor, because I can see all of their blood tests from when 10 years ago, 
to the present day. I can see what interactions they've had with drugs, what would work, and obviously the more information, the better a diagnosis, the better treatment I can offer. Unfortunately, as you can expect, this is the true patient I see. Okay, <laughs> somebody who is quite carefree, happy-go-lucky, and at the end of the day, most people, I hope most of you in this room, trust your doctor and will trust me as well. Okay, he is your typical patient. Genuinely, when I sit and talk to a patient, and it's one-to-one, -one, I know they've gone away completely trusting what I've said to them. And I go away thinking, I really hope all the information he or she gave me was the correct information for me to give them that correct diagnosis, that correct treatment. I'm not expecting this patient to know all the medical jargon that I do. And neither am I expecting this patient to have all their medical records with them. If we could utilise today's technologies, maybe we could get around this problem. Essentially, the point I'm trying to make is we don't have the complete picture. Okay? I will see them in my clinic, another doctor will see them in their clinic, a pharmacist will see them in the chemist. But if we all just took a step back together and had a look at the picture together, we would say, this is clearly an elephant. Yes? So, common misconceptions. So you'll probably ask, well, don't you doctors talk to each other? Don't you pharmacists and chemists and nurses all talk to each other? Locally, maybe. If the clinic is associated with the hospital, yes, we do have some good direct con connections. But definitely not cross-city, definitely not cross-country, and impossible across the world. So if you were in an accident in Spain and the Spanish doctor had given you some medications or some treatment, when you came back here to Switzerland, they'd have no idea. And they would be depending on you to tell them exactly what happened. It'd be nice if you had some kind of record to show for that. Well, what's the point of identification numbers? Here or around Europe, you use social security numbers. In the United Kingdom, you use the NHS number, the National Health Service number. This number, as, as me and Andre have been talking about earlier, is just a form of identification. So I have two patients who are called Joe Smith. I have two patients born 1st of January 1970. But this Joe Smith has this NHS number or social security number, and this one has the other one. It's not a number where we are uploading all this information to a cloud and we can all share this between ourselves. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. And I think a lot of patients or the, the public uh, aren't aware of this. Uh, so finally, if we can share this information, how are we doing this at the moment? And we're sharing information between hospitals and people's local doctors by something called a discharge summary, which I'll go on to explain. So we come back to our patient here, Joe. So Joe's happily going along his business. Any problems he has, he talks to his own family doctor. Unfortunately, Joe's involved in a car accident. He's admitted to a hospital. In the hospital, again, friendly Dr. Nick investigates all his problems, finds out he's broken quite a few bones, passes him on to the surgeon who fixes his bones, and after two weeks, Joe's back in the community, back with his own local doctor. Now, there is a clinical note which is generated, and that's called a discharge summary. And the discharge summary is meant to say, this is why you came to hospital, this is what we did for you, this is what we need you to do when you leave hospital. Be that remove stitches, finish your antibiotics, see your doctors have your blood test repeated. So we're really depending on this document. Without this document, I'm taking all my information from a lay person, from the member of public, trying to explain to me all that happened to them. So really, communication is key, is what we're going on. And if we could target some areas of this communication link, we could strengthen this, and as I say, essentially for the benefit of the patient. And the patient is always our main focus and our guiding compass in all of our ideas. So at Medical Chain, we try to address this issue. There are many issues with communication in the health, healthcare system, and those who have worked in it will be aware of that as well. We've targeted this discharge summary, which was at the beginning of our plans, and we've had some great success there. Um, so just to, before getting ahead of myself, when we were coming to the idea of forming a discharge summary, we said we would love to develop some form of template where the doctors in the hospital can reduce their admin time by putting concise, specific information in this discharge summary, so it saves them time producing it, where the family doctor will have a concise document rather than reading pages and pages. They can go straight to the points which is relevant to the family doctor. And most importantly, for the patient themselves. So you and I, I'm also a patient. I'd, I'd be happy to have a record of what went on. I'd be happy to keep a record telling me what the next follow-up appointment is and what the plans were going to be. So we developed this website called discharge-summary.co.uk. This is a website where the doctors in the United Kingdom are logging in. They are going through essentially a template down the right-hand side, and eventually they are generating a form at the end. So these templates are specifically targeted 
at what that medical condition was. So if I'm going on, well, I don't want to get too technical, but there's some medical conditions where I need to know some information, and there's other medical conditions I need to know other information. So we've had quite good success with this. So in Leeds, which is the biggest teaching hospital in Europe, which is in north of the United Kingdom, we're using this system in the cardiology department. Down the pipeline, we have other departments, other, other hospitals that we are producing these templates for now as well. Uh, we've been approached actually by several pharmaceutical companies asking to fund us and to drive this forward as well. Uh, but we're not satisfied there and we didn't want to stop there because now we've had good success with this. The momentum has driven us to see, well, what other aspect of communication between doctors and patients can we improve? Uh, I won't bore you with this, uh, but these are some uh, comments from the doctors that have been using it. Uh, and essentially, the seed has now been planted. I'll hand over to Mo. So uh, before I go into the technology, I'll just give you a personal story of mine. About 10 years ago, my mom had a stroke. And um, we were a bit panicking as a family because we were trying to figure out what to do. And, and uh, we wanted to get the best uh, medical advice. She had a biopsy, and the results were not conclusive. There were some uh, other doctors saying, oh, we need to probably do another biopsy. And she wasn't in a very good condition. So, we thought, um, let's try and get the advice of someone outside the country who's a bit more specialist. So we thought we can potentially go to Mayo Clinic. And uh, because my mother had been to all these, like, four different hospitals, uh, I had to literally drive around to all the different hospitals, get the documentation from them on paper, uh, get it photocopied, and then um, put it all together and send it to, by email to the doctors in, in Mayo Clinic. So, and this problem still exists today. If I wanted to do the same thing today, it would still exist today. The, uh, the doctors in Mayo Clinic receive an email that looks like that. So they then have to, you know, you have to rely on their own organization or secretaries to go through these PDF files and figure out, what, you know, sift through them, what's going on, what's relevant, what's not relevant. I don't know. I just send everything that's come across to me. They have to figure out how, how to deal with it. And unfortunately, um, this system still exists today. You may not be uh, satisfied with the information your doctor has given you and you want to get a second opinion or a third opinion. Um, especially if it's something that's worrying you. And, uh, and if you go to another doctor you've never seen before, you have to take your documents physically. And if that doctor is not in your country and you could just send it to them so they can see it and give you a response without you having to go and see them, um, there's, there's, it's quite a complicated process. So what we're trying to build here is an ecosystem with multiple touch points. And it, uh, so that people who were in my shoes 10 years ago wouldn't have to do this. And not just people who, who've got a chronic illness. It should be anybody who's got a medical record, which is everybody. So if you've got a medical record, you should be able to have access to that when you want. You're, you know, in, in life today, as you travel, you have your email travels with you, your bank account travels with you, your phone travels with you, but your medical record stays where you left it at home. So if you go somewhere else and you want to get treatment, or if you want to get second opinion or something, you literally cannot do that without taking a physical record. Um, so our approach, similar to uh, what we did with this charge summary, is taking a, a bottom-up approach. So uh, with this charge summary, we went to the doctors directly and we got them to start using this in a kind of underdog way. Um, but when we did that, the hospitals took notice and they said, hang on a minute, you guys are doing something pretty smart here. What are you doing? And then, and then they took notice. They then you know, uh, found uh, and saw how, how useful the software was and they wanted to adopt it. Um, we're looking to do the same thing here. So we, we're going to uh, the, the patients first, and then we're trying to create this patient and doctor relationship. Uh, we're going to start with moving medical records that already exist onto uh, the blockchain, and we're going to allow patients to share those records with doctors of their choice. So you might have a, a spot on your face, and you want to go directly to a dermatologist. You don't want to go to your family doctor and get a referral and go to another doctor, and by the time you see the other doctor, it's three or four days, and the spots become bigger. You know, you want to have your own medical record, find a dermatologist, quickly get access to them, and, and, uh, and, and get the uh, resolution, or, 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 or go to um, you know, ex expedite the, the operation. So if a patient goes to... Uh, a, a hospital, they normally have these different touch points. So patients will go into hospital, they'll talk to a doctor, the doctor might give them a scan or send them to the laboratory for a scan or a blood test result. Um, they then may prescribe them something, which, so they go to the pharmacy. Uh, they then have to go to the insurance company to uh, make a claim and set the payment. So these are, these are different touch points. Uh, you've, we, we've also got these institutions, we've got wearable devices that are um, 
you know, tracking data about you and, and constantly keeping data about you. And then there's pharmaceutical companies who might come back later on and want to look at your record when you came to the hospital and see um, if there's something to be learned there with uh, future research. So we're trying to build a system that can um, bridge the gap between all of these uh, touch points and uh, put the patient in control uh, with all the access. So how are we going to do this? Um, the patient should have a uh, multi-level permission access to their electronic health record. Okay? So the patient has got full control. The patient should be able to give time-limited access to their uh, doctor or to their hospital of choice. And when that doctor or hospital is no longer treating them, they should be able to revoke that access. Okay? And when your health record is being updated, you should know about it. So if, the, if you saw a doctor and, and doc, you, know, you saw them in a hurry and you left and doctor the next day wrote you know, a whole essay about you, you won't probably know that unless he sent it to you. But you should get a notification to say, you know, this is the final report and, and, it, and it coincides with what you were told when you were in the practice. So this would move us into some kind of a doctor-patient platform. Uh, this, is, this is our platform that we're building at the moment. So um, if you had your health record on a, uh, you know, in an accessible format, you can talk to a doctor. Uh, this is the doctor's interface. The doctor's talking to the patient while at the same time having access to their record on the side and not just going by the information that they're giving them over a video. The other parts of the application is the connectivity to health insurance. So right now you have a lot of people who've got private health insurance, but they actually don't know that they're underinsured because when you took out that private health insurance policy in the first place, I don't know specifically in Switzerland, but certainly in the UK, I can make a private health insurance policy in five minutes. Uh, I can call up the insurance company They'll say to me, okay, do you have any medical conditions? Do you have this? Do you have that? And I'll be like, no, 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 I'm feeling healthy. Everything is fine. I said, okay, here's your premium, and, and that's it. And you forget about it. And then two years later, something comes up. You go to the hospital. You realize there's a previous condition you had five years ago. You're not actually insured for this condition. And so, therefore, you, uh, all this premium you've been paying for the last two or three years is useless because the, the uh, insurance company is not going to pay for you. So um, having this accurate data from, for the insurance company will be able to uh, ensure that you, you're, you're, you're covered under the right risk and you're being charged the right premium for it. And, and obviously there's benefits to the insurance company as well, that there is uh, uh, proper tracking being placed on the insurance claims and there's no uh, a reduced amount of fraud and there's no paperwork. Um, we come later to talk about how the information is accessible, but one of the um, other applications that we uh, talk about later is a medical bracelet where if you have a chronic condition, and in the US, uh, one in three people have got some kind of long-term illness, such as diabetes or asthma. Uh, so if you have a chronic condition that's quite serious and you know, you're likely to at any time have a heart attack or a stroke or um, fall ill somehow that you become unconscious and someone needs your information about you and access, immediate access to your health record, something like that with an NFC chip or a QR code that will be able to bring up your health record wherever you are around the world will probably be quite useful and help the doctor um, in, in saving your life. Um, another application that we've got is licensing your electronic health record to pharmaceutical companies and uh, research companies. So currently, um, when, when the doctor is in the hospital and there's a pharmaceutical company who wants to do some research, they approach the hospital and they want to get access to, say, 100 uh, patients who've had um, uh, you know, heart disease. Uh, they want to access their records. What happens is, they, they go to the patients, they get them to sign a blanket consent form, they then have to go to all the doctors that have treated uh, a particular patient, let's say, and get all uh, four or five health records about that patient, collate them together, put them in chronological order, and you've got a health record about a patient. And they have to do that for every single patient that they want to get uh, access uh, um, to. So, if we were able to present that information in a uh, in an accurate format and in a chronological order and having uh, a single version of the truth for all the health records of that patient, pharmaceutical companies, the ones that we've been talking to, would be quite happy to pay to have that access to data and um, pay the patient to, to have access to their data so they can do their research. Alternatively, you might have charitable organizations who are on limited budget who just want to do some research and um, not pay the patient, but they may be able to share the results with the patient and um, you know, give them some assessment. Uh, and then finally, um, app developers. You know, nowadays there are so many health apps. If you go on your um, iPhone or your Android uh, app store, you'll find that there's so many health apps available out there that are analyzing all sorts of movements or fitness or um, 
uh, giving you nutritional advice, fitness advice, calorie counting, but where does that data all go? It's normally sitting in silos, either on your iPhone, and then you know, your doctor never gets to see it. Uh, you, you know, if you change your phone, unless it's stored in the cloud, you, you, know, you might end up starting again with all that. If we're, able to, um, give, if we're able to store that information somewhere central that belongs to you, and you gave access to those apps who can then analyze your data, you can get some pretty interesting results. And we're not talking about new technologies here. There are so many apps available right now, and there's so many technologies that exist today that you could utilize if you just had the information in the right place and you connected all the dots together. So why use blockchain technology? Well, what we're talking about here is we want access to a, uh, a health record, a single version of truth, putting it all together. We want to make it secure. We want to be able to share it with another doctor in a secure way. We want to, make it, uh, we want to give time-limited access to that record. We want it accessible everywhere, but we also want it to be private and confidential and only accessible to the patient. So there's all these complexity challenges about the data and how it's being used. And, and blockchain solves a lot of these problems, subject to the right ledger that you use and the right technologies. And uh, Andre and I were debating about different types uh, earlier on. Then you've obviously got the complexities of this. So the technology is complex. Um, you guys are here because you know or you understand blockchain or you have an interest in blockchain. But if you go outside in the street and you talk to someone about blockchain, you know, uh, you know you'll get a stare in the face, and uh, it's still pretty early on. And this is why uh, regu regulatory um, bodies are still unable to properly regulate cryptocurrencies. Uh, I think only Japan right now is uh, regulating a Bitcoin. So uh, again, it's uh, regulatory complications make it quite difficult. You've got implementation challenges. Uh, every in, in our example, in the NHS, you have so many hospitals up and down the country, but they all use different um, health record systems. They don't all use the same software, which you'd think that they would if they all belong to the government. But they make the decisions on a local level. And I'm sure this exists in lots of other countries too. Um, and then there's competing platforms. You know, we're, not, you know, we're part of dozens of companies who are uh, coming up with different solutions for healthcare on the blockchain. And, um, and there's not going to be one winner. There's probably going to be quite a few different companies uh, in this space. And then it's going to be a case of which blockchain is your health record sitting on if we get there. So uh, we decided to use Hyperledger Fabric for this. And uh, if, if you, for those who don't know much about Hyperledger Fabric, it's a permission blockchain, uh, which means that you have member service and you have different roles. So member service makes, means that only permitted users have got access to uh, be able to participate. Uh, it also means that uh, there are different roles. So uh, the patient has a role, the hospital has a role, the doctor has a role. So th as an example, the patient has got a role to be able to see and grant access to their health record, but you don't really want the patient to be editing the health record and writing them prescriptions for themselves. The doctor can see the health record subject to the uh, patient's permission, and then they can write the relevant data about them assuming that the doctor is qualified and, and has been approved on the platform. Um, compliance with local laws. Uh, you know, th this is still a great area at the moment, and it's one that we're always having a discussion about. But the fact that the next point about it being supported by the business world, Hyperledger Fabric was originally designed by IBM, and it was given to the Linux Foundation, and it's now become a very large open source project that's rapidly developing. So it gives us some confidence that the fact that it's being supported by a business world and there's lots of businesses that are interested in using it and figuring out ways to, to use it and building proof of concepts on it, um, that eventually something like this is going to work well. Um, if you aren't familiar with Hyperledger Fabric, uh, this is a quick comparison table between uh, Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum. Uh, the main thing you've got here is the consensus mechanism where Ethereum is using uh, proof of work and Hyperledger Fabric is using uh, something called PBFT, or Broad Understanding of Consensus, that allows multiple approaches. Uh, you still have smart contracts within it, and um, Hyperledger is more of a modular uh, blockchain platform. So how do we put this on a, uh, this health record information on a blockchain? This is a pretty simplistic diagram. So uh, we have an application layer where the doctors and the patients can interface on. So, um, a doctor here could be putting a health record on the, uh, updating the patient's health record or putting a health record object. It would be converted into a medical chain object and encrypted. The hash 
uh, of the encryption is, is stored on the uh, hyperledger. So we, we basically we put a pointer on the, on the ledger to the, where the object is stored on the private cloud in, in the scenario. And then similarly, when you want to retrieve that data, you use your private key to unlock the ledger and, and view the uh, pointer, and then you will go to the pointer and decrypt that information. You would compare the two hashes to make sure the data has not been corrupted, and then you can um, decrypt that data and uh, view it. So one of the things that we get asked about quite a lot is, uh, well, who should guard this data? I mean, you, you're, a, um, you're a startup uh, on the block. Why should you take data off the hospital uh, records and you guard it yourself? I mean, who are we? So, um, and it's a very good question. And I think a lot of companies, whether they're you know, large companies that have existed for decades or startups like myself, uh, there are a lot of people chat, um, being challenged by this kind of uh, question. So we thought about an alternative scenario. We thought about, uh, and, and bear with me with this, um, have you guys heard of the um, DNS system, the domain name system? And, and uh, if you're quite technical, you will be familiar with how, how it works, which is basically, uh, if you register a domain name, like a .com or a .net domain name, um, that, gets, uh, that goes into an authority server, and there are 13 different authoritative nodes around the world that manage these um, domain names. And they're usually run by uh, foundations or non-profit organizations or universities and mainly in the US and, and around Europe as well. So, uh, and this is why governments are, uh, they struggle to bring a website down. So if, uh, because they'd have to get all these organizations to get together and, and, and remove a record or change a record on their uh, system. So what the, the best thing a government can do is go to someone like Swisscom and say, can you please stop uh, anyone accessing the WikiLeaks domain name or something like that. And so uh, that's how people get banned from accessing websites. But actually, the website record, the record to access that website, the domain name, is still there. And it's being guarded by these non foundations. So we thought, if, if this works well for the DNS system, and it's been working well for the last 20 to 30 years, why can't we do that with health records? Why can't we get uh, non-profit organizations to be the guardians of your health record? We, as medical chain, don't want to, we don't want to hold your health record. We want to be able to contribute the technology, configure, co the configuration of the ledger, uh, the building of the interface, um, but we're not really interested in holding your health record. We believe this should be done by a non-profit organization and a, a multitude of them so that uh, they would all have to collude for there to be corruption or a, um, a data leak. So, um, if you're familiar with how Hyperledger works, you've got peers, and, and those peers are, uh, they're effectively different nodes, the different nodes of the ledger and, and how um, uh, the data is stored. So in a, in a uh, cross-jurisdiction example, you have in the US, you've got the HIPAA uh, regulation of how data or healthcare data should be handled. In the UK, you've also got um, a different regulation of, of how data should be handled. And, and certainly the US don't want their citizens' data to be stored in Europe, and Europe don't want their citizens' data to be stored in the US. So this is just an example of two, two uh, jurisdictions. Obviously, in some countries, you've got um, you know, jurisdictions within cities or within states that also have different regulations. So this could be applied to the same thing. So you've got these um, six peers here, uh, which are uh, managing the chain code and keeping a consistent state uh, of the ledger. Um, when a patient's record is being uh, put on a blockchain, one of the fields will be, as an example, citizenship of that patient. And we can then say, right, if a patient is a US citizen, then their record, the, the hash is stored here, but the pointer points to a, um, a US-based cloud. And uh, similarly, uh, in jurisdiction two, uh, if you have a patient with different uh, citizenship, they can be put in this um, cloud storage. However, if you're in the US and you travel to Europe and um, you need access to your health uh, record, you can still access it and uh, the pointer will point to a cloud in the US which you can then fetch the record, you can um, add to it, modify it, view, uh, show it to your um, doctor or healthcare professional and when it gets saved, it gets saved back onto <coughs> the uh, US cloud. So it's kind of like similar how your bank works if, you know, in layman's terms. When you travel, you don't actually take your bank account with you uh, but, you, but there are means in the UK, like Visa and MasterCard, that will give you access to your bank account in the US, uh, so you can do certain transactions, but it doesn't mean that you're moving your money here and moving it back when you travel back. Um, 
with all of this, there are so many other considerations that we are you know, still thinking about. So, for example, what happens if a patient loses their private key? And, um, and, and at least the next question is, should there be an authority that ultimately has access to all the private keys? Uh, this can be fixed on a jurisdiction level, or, or we could give the patient you know, um, the choice and say, look, you know, this private key, if you lose it, your, your records are, are all gone. Or, or if you want to you know, kind of de-risk it a little bit, maybe give one of those trusted uh, non-profit organizations um, access to your private key so they can keep it for you. Uh, and then also, should patients be allowed to add or edit their record? Uh, I mean, uh, if you talk to a the doctor, they'll obviously say, no, you don't want a patient to prescribe themselves a weekly dosage of morphine uh, because they feel like it. You, you, want the you want the doctor to be able to do that. What happens to the record when a patient dies? So currently in the UK, uh, the regulation is if a patient dies, the record stays for 10 years. Uh, the reason is if for whatever, if um, something came up later on that showed that there was um, a mystery around this patient's death and, and the health record helped uh, identify why this patient died, then, then that could be retrieved. Uh, we can also, you know, talk about anonymizing these health records. They could be useful to, uh, for research, uh, particularly if a patient died because of a chronic illness. And then what happens in emergency situations? So if you've got your health record locked on a blockchain, what will happen if you are unconscious and the doctor that's treating you needs to know, you know what's happened to you previously? And this is, goes back to the chain uh, photo that I showed you earlier about having access to your health records through um, giving some certain information on a chain. Or it could be that you, we only give you summarized information, like Mr. Smith is uh, you know, type 2 diabetes and allergic to nuts, and that's all you need to know if you're treating them in an emergency situation. So um, these are the uh, considerations that we're making. We're here to present to you uh, about what we have done uh, so far. And uh, you know, we don't have a full final picture yet, but we are working towards these. And it could be that some of these problems are solved on a jurisdiction level rather than in a, uh, you know, on a global level. And um, if you want to work with us, we would welcome that. We're looking for healthcare advisors, technical advisors, um, legal and compliance, marketing, community management, and everything else. So feel free to get in touch with us and connect and see how we could potentially work together. These are our um, details. All right, thank you very much. So most of the hospitals or insurance companies are going to use some kind of software provided by a vendor. And um, we would have to take a vendor approach where we, will, where we will go to the vendor and get them to uh, build APIs or allow us access to their APIs that we can then uh, um, connect to their system. We're taking, as, as I mentioned earlier, we're not going, you know, to, to do this, we're not going to the hospitals first or to the insurance companies. We're going to the patient first. And we're getting the patient to get comfortable with putting the health record on a blockchain and to be able to use it. Once the hospitals see that there's enough patients that are actually doing this and there is a general interest, they will then move to where the patient need and do this. And they will, they, you know, they will find ways. I mean, right now, our, um, our initial step is we're gonna create an interface where anyone can go onto it. They will sign a blanket consent form and tell us all the doctors they've been to. We will then use that and go and get their record from the doctors and we'll put it uh, on the blockchain and give them their private key. So uh, moving forward, if the hospital see that there's enough demand for this kind of service, they will eventually give us access and say, look, you know, we don't want to keep sending you paper here. Here's our API, and you can connect to it and download the data. And, and you can also download cycles of synchronization every once in a while to keep that data up to date. You have a kind of a two-level storage. And the second level is, uh, also on the first level, you have this pointer, this hash. Yeah. And on the second level, you, you, you have what? If, uh, is there an existing system of uh, health records? And the, how do you guarantee that, he, that your hash, your pointer is still valid if the system isn't there? Or, or 
perhaps you can explain a bit, bit more about this second level. Well, the reason why you have to have second level is because if you put, sometimes health records can be very big files. Like if you have an MRI scan, the... the Technically it's clear, but yeah. practically. Practically, you would have to use, I suppose, you know, in uh, encryption, you'd have to use, uh, mul uh, you know, failover storage and, you know, distributed storage in different locations. Uh, and, and again, the, the storage will be just like any storage that the hospital is using but potentially more secure. So you could say the same about the storage that's being used in hospitals today when we had uh, a couple months ago or three months ago we had the attack in, on the NHS and there was uh, <coughs> leaks of medical records. So at least what we're doing here is encrypting it. But how do you guarantee that the pointer is still valid if you have not control over the second level of storage? Why wouldn't you have control over the second level of storage? Because it's on the hospital, you said? Or no, it's not on the hospital. It wouldn't be in the hospital. It would be on a private cloud that's managed by the organization that's managing the node. I didn't really understand how far you are with the project. Okay, so uh, right now, um, we built a prototype of this system. We built it using IBM Bluemix because they've uh, got support for Hyperledger. Um, we haven't gone live with it. We're still in uh, doing various prototyping and development. And um, the initial phase is for us to launch an app by the end of the year to allow patients to move their health record on the blockchain. Uh, in terms of existing, um, where we've got to so far with discharge summary, We've already got that in hospitals uh, being used right now, but that's not a blockchain application. That's just to show you that we've been able to make inroads in the hospital, and we can do this too because uh, of the method that we've taken, which is a, a bottom-up approach. Hi. Uh, um, how do you make money? Um, well, ultimately, like I said before, we're a company that wants to be able to contribute to this project by way of updating the ledger and by way of uh, you know, creating uh, solutions. So there are different ways we can make money. Uh, we are, uh, I haven't really gone into talk about this, but we are going to be doing an ICO where we're going to be issuing tokens and the tokens will allow um, patients to redeem them on the platform by paying for storage, paying for uh, speaking to other doctors, connecting with other doctors, connecting with healthcare apps, will obviously make some money by taking a commission from that transaction. So that's uh, one way. Uh, there are other ways of making money by uh, providing this, if we were to provide this service to different jurisdictions, we would be the ones that are uh, putting it in, we could license it to them. The multiple revenue models. So your focus is based on the UK uh, our focus has initially been uh, on the UK, but there's no reason why uh, we cannot get this to go globally. Because, uh, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do is allow patients to talk to doctors, not just in the UK, but you know, abroad. For example, you might, you might have someone who believes in herbal medicine or alternative medicine, and they don't want to go to the doctor and get antibiotics because they're sick of it. So they want to go and speak to a Chinese doctor and get a prescription for some herbal medicine. Uh, on the platform. So for this to work, you're going to need the network effect of doctors around the world to be able to connect to it from day one. So we're not uh, focusing on any specific country right now, but we're based in the UK and, and because of uh, <coughs> being in the hospitals, it gives us that uh, um, foot in the door. We've had, we've had other uh, doctors and consultants from other regions of the world yeah. interested in the system as well. So <coughs> because we're not going from a top-down approach, from, from a bottom-up approach, we're hoping those consultants in America or in Germany can introduce the system <coughs> locally for their services as well, and make inroads the way that we have with Discharge Summit, first of all, and how we plan to do with this as well. Um, I recall that at some point you said that you can end up with having different ledger, like different startup doing the same thing, for example. And, uh, in that case, <coughs> how would you address the it, it wouldn't be different ledgers. It would be different peers or different nodes, but they're all uh, managing the same ledger states. So I think you're referring to this slide here. No, no, because at the beginning you say that another startup also can do the same thing in the healthcare, right? Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what I was saying there is that there are obviously lots of other blockchain startups who are going into the healthcare space, yeah. and. Um, you know, unless, unless they all get together and form a consensus that they can use a single ledger and they all you know, contribute to that ledger, 
uh, what's more likely going to be the case, in my opinion, is is you're going to have a multitude of uh, companies that are all running their own blockchain, and you know this this blockchain can give you these facilities, want to give you these facilities, and, and it's up to you where you want your data. Is. Yeah. I, I think that's where that's it, it looks like that's where we're going. Yeah, because from a user perspective, yeah. at the end of the day, you would like those blockchains to be able to talk to each other. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, and also, we, I mean, the whole idea of talking to you today as well and doing this roadshow is because we want to encourage this collaboration. Um, because we're starting as well, we're giving ourselves a chance to build and establish ourselves. And then once we reach our mass and they've reached their mass, if it makes sense and it can work, then we'd love to co collaborate with others. Uh, for the benefits of the patients at the end of the day. And there are technologies now like Polkadot and Cosmos which are in very early stages of development. There are developing applications that will allow two chains to communicate with each other. But at the moment, that's not really feasible in today's um, <coughs> technology. Hi. Um, yep. I'm interested really like, uh, at one party of the incentives. Like yep. in the Bitcoin world, you have uh, lots of miners um, doing this yeah. You have the different rules. Um, and here I, I learned you have some kind of like the high potential fabricant validators, and you were somewhere in the slide saying these are the ones who should hold our independent miners, and how are they incentivized? So, with high potential fabric, there's no miners. Uh, there's no, but validators. The, the validators will. So, if a patient is paying to have their record on a blockchain, a portion of that payment is going to go towards the maintenance of that. And, and so that will be divided into the peers that are managing these nodes, and, and, and essentially that's how they're going to be paid. So uh, is, that, is that what you mean? So I'm going to understand correctly the patient would pay to get his record on the blockchain. So the, the patient would pay, yes, or um, let's say... Uh, I, I imagine a scenario where the insurance company is very interested in seeing the patient's medical record, in which case they say, hey, we'll pay for you to put your record on the blockchain. That could also be a scenario. Uh, there could also be a scenario where the uh, research company pays the patient by um, giving them accessibility to their record. So it becomes a kind of a marketplace where, yes, the patient does pay, but can also get rewards and get paid back at the same time. And doctors, you know, there's a lot of... Um, doctors out there right now that would like to do more work but, but, um, and, and doing this from their home and giving some private consultations in, in the evening is, uh, is, is quite convenient so they could also get paid for being on, on the platform. So th that's where the patient uh, would pay, it wouldn't just be on the health report. So you, you put your hand up many times. Yeah. And it would also mean that, that the technology uh, or the whole system is quite difficult to understand. Uh, so I guess most, most patients will not be able to understand the advantages uh, of the solution. So how do, you, uh, how do you want to sell the solution? Why a patient should, should exactly choose this uh, solution compared to another already existing uh, healthcare solution, uh, electronic health record solution? So there is, uh, it's, it's a really good question. You know, if, uh, if the system works for you today, why, why bother changing, right? Um, th there's, a, there's a big community out there right now of people who want to see this change and they don't really want their health record to be owned by an institution. I mean, just recently, um, I think two months ago, you had uh, the NHS illegally gave, uh, it was found out that they illegally gave 1.6 million records to Google DeepMind for, uh, without the patient's rec uh, knowledge. There's a lot of people upset about that, and that's a driver for patients to say, actually, I want to put my record somewhere else. So, um, you know, th there's a lot of drivers out there right now that are doing it. Um, it's, you know, y you're right. Some people are never going to want to do that, and, they, and, and this kind of reminds me when, when Facebook started out. You know, a lot of people were thinking, well, why would I want to put all my family photos on, online? You know, I want to keep this private. Uh, but, but eventually... Uh, people saw a benefit in being able to communicate better with their friends and, and yeah. communities and they did that. 
And I think that'll be another driver. I think um, the, the public have a lot of faith in how their records are currently stored. So when you say there's you know, a, a lack of education of what the blockchain can bring, I think there's already a lack of education of what the current system is. Uh, there's a, a famous footballer, if anybody's into football, called Bobby Robson, who played for Newcastle, was a manager of Newcastle United. He went into hospital with cancer. And within a space of a few hours, his record was accessed 100 times by the doctors and nurses in the hospital. So they're all interested in this legend, what happened to him. So in our system, you can only access the records if you have given permission to that clinician to access that record. And you can revoke that access as well. So I think, yes, there needs to be an education to the public. To, but like any product, if you're going to sell a product to them, you have to show them that this is actually the current system. And this is what we're offering. You're more than welcome to continue using the current system but you will be lacking the benefits which we are trying to bring to you. But, uh, but to, to your pain, this, uh, or this, this function, you don't need blockchain necessarily. Can you, can you maybe uh, bring up the, the one slide where you have the pros and cons of the blockchain? Maybe the question was the slide. Well, the other compete with solution like like health bank or something like that, uh, which is also organized publicly and for Well, the other, I mean, the, the whole point of blockchain is the fact that it's a distributed ledger, and yeah. and, and and you've got uh, uh, un uncorruptible transactions, right? So that, that's uh, quite important, having uh, a consistent sequence of events and and not having uh, things jump each other, and, and also not deleting records, okay? So, that, so these are the different uh, scenarios. Um, if you don't do, if you don't use a system like a blockchain or a distributed ledger, then uh, your other option is to use a central authority. So then it's a case of which central authority do you want to belong to, and who are you going to trust your data? That's what it's going to come down to. Not really. If you take um, uh, a system like a distributed file system, or I don't know, like even version GitHub, where you have a lot of people working offline, then you can keep some the value proposition of the blockchain is either being in a smart contract mode or, or being in uh, 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 somewhere where people don't trust you over, then you use the consensus. So uh, apart that, that's, I mean, two main key points, but now if you use it just like a distributed database, then of course it works, but it comes to the question why blockchain. But you're still gonna be, uh, I appreciate that you can get a distributed database, but you're still gonna be, um, you know, ask the question, who's going to manage the database? Who, because a distributed database doesn't mean that uh, someone can't come and hack it or delete uh, a record from it, right? And, where, and when it's distributed, where is it distributed to? So where are all the different nodes going to sit? There's all these other complexities around it. I mean, one of the main issues with a, dis uh, with a uh, distributed database is you can still delete records and the idea behind this is that you have a medical history where you don't, you know, you can't just delete records that you don't like. So if you were a heroin addict five years ago, uh, you can't just say, I don't want really people to see that, I'm just going to delete that from now on. And then, you know, the doctors don't see that anymore. So if you're a heroin addict again, the doctor's not going to know that you used to be five years ago as well. That, that's, that could be one scenario, for example. Even from the doctor's perspective, from a medical legal aspect, I mean, doc doctors have been in trouble before and been struck off before because they go back into medical records handwritten medical records. They try removing pages or, or removing items when they've done something wrong. Um, so we think that the blockchain technology is going to give that transparency. Um, I think really the simplest argument to it is blockchain seems to be the future with everything. So why not get ahead of the game? Why work on an old system when this is going to come anyway in the next 10, 15 years? So why don't we get ahead of the game and start trying to put the medical records on this kind of technology which they're really using in the financial sector? I got one last question. You have listed several challenges. Uh, could you tell what are the biggest ones that don't let you sleep? Or biggest ones that let me sleep? <laughs> a good question. Um, so I think the main I think the main issue for me personally is the issue of who holds the private key, and um, and should we allow patients to. 
uh, hold their private key and only them holding their private key because uh, I genuinely believe that you know, in the interest of the patient, there should be another authority that holds a private key for them that can look out for their interest when that patient is in trouble or when they're unconscious or you know, if your house burns down and you lose your private key, should you lose your medical record? You don't lose your bank account. Why should you use a bank record? So I think that that's the probably the biggest issue. But then, um, you know, I think with a bit of education, people may not necessarily want to just keep their private key. They'd probably be happy to share it as long as it's not going to go uh, too far. But also, who do they share it with? And you don't want to have a database of patients' private keys that gets hacked and all of a sudden everything else is uh, made available. That's probably something uh, that that would uh, keep me awake at night. Cool, thank you very much. Um, okay. So I think this was, was a good start. You have very good questions and I like it. So I hope that I can get you to get a drink, you know, it's very warm in here and have lots more questions and conversations about it. So I think it's a very interesting topic. Uh, there's good questions about why blockchain. I think there is a need for blockchain technology or there's a use case because there's quite a few issues which you can't solve with centralized systems in the patient record. Um, to consider, but I think we have a kickstart, good conversations, and please feel free to ask any more questions. Thank you guys yep. for coming. Thank you for having us. Thank you.